guys. Uh, it's week three already. Thank you for logging on on Blackboard. Uh, let's get into this week's lecture. And let's start with what exactly is exchanged in soils. Um, soils can exchange many different things into either the atmosphere and into plants especially. Um, this exchange includes temperature, gases, water, carbon, and nutrients. The exchange of temperature within soil is really important and uh, it depends on numerous factors, but pretty much solar radiation uh, directly heats the soil. Um, but you know, soil and the ground itself has the ability to store that heat. So a lot of times the soil doesn't immediately warm, but over, you know, gradually over time it will. So as the soil temperature warms, you know, the temperature increases, it heats a shallow layer uh, directly above the soil, uh, and this is called conduction. This thin layer of air in the turn heats that um, layer just above uh, the soil with a, a cooler air. Now with gas exchange, we focus on nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Now the exchange of these gases between soil and the atmosphere is facilitated between two mechanisms. Uh, one is called mass flow, and the other one is called diffusion. Mass flow is the movement of fluids down a pressure or a temperature gradient. Now this occurs through the exchange of gases between soil and the atmosphere when moisture is lost by evaporation and transpiration and the air from the atmosphere enters the soil pores. As the soil gets heated during the day, you know, it expands um, and the exp expanded air moves out into the atmosphere. Then the soil begins to cool a bit um, and then that's the point where soil air contracts and the air in the atmosphere is drawn in. Now with diffusion, that's with um, most of the gas exchange occurs, um, not really through mass flow as much, but diffusion is our main uh, central facilitator for the exchange of gases between soil and the atmosphere. The atmosphere and soil contains a number of gases, including nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, you know, you guys know the rest of them. Um, but the main point within diffusion, it allows movement and the continual change of gases between the air, uh, the soil air, and the, um, the air in the atmosphere. So you can focus on like oxygen and carbon dioxide being uh, two of the most important gases that take in diffusion. Now I know you guys already know, you know, the water cycle and whatnot, but I will briefly go over it. Now the cycle starts when the water on the Earth's surface evaporates. Following that, the water collects as vapor within the sky. Um, the water and the clouds get extremely cold, which will make this become liquid again. And then the water falls from the sky um, as some kind of precipitation, if that's rain, snow, hail. And then the water also goes to the Earth's surface again through the oceans, lakes, and evaporates again. And the cycle continues. Plants need soil for a ton of things. The main factors that we'll focus on is anchorage, water, oxygen, and nutrients. So imagine for a second that, you know, you're a forest tree, just like the picture that we see here. You know, have you ever wondered why and how those trees manage to stand up year after year and they don't just tip over like that? Well, um, the answer lies within the soil, and that's the big importance of soil, the stuff that we don't really think about every day. Um, but yeah, so one of the most important roles that soil plays is anchorage for many trees and other vegetation, other plants um, that grow. In this case, with the large tree, uh, this has a big responsibility for soil. And this, at this point, the soil or the uh, tree did tip over. But in other cases, that point where soil can anchor, you know, the tree can anchor to the soil so it's not going anywhere. It doesn't have that tippage, but this does obviously occur in nature. Water is very important to plant growth. Um, it helps plants move nutrients from soil up through the stems and leaves, and it keeps the plant moist and flexible and helps the plant make its own food. You guys also know the cycle here. Plants take in carbon dioxide from the air to use in the process of what? photosynthesis and gives off the oxygen that we use every day. 
soil is a major source of nutrients needed for plants for growth. Uh, the three main nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, that MPK, and then other nutrients uh, also include calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Plants also may need small quantities of iron, magnesium, zinc, copper, etc. Overall, plants need that 17 major nutrients, um, and three come from the air and water, and that's that carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. But 14 of those 17 major nutrients are coming from the soil. So you can see the importance that soil has on plant nutrient and plant growth. Okay, now I'm gonna briefly explain the 12 orders of soil taxonomy. Uh, soil ta this, these 12 orders of soil taxonomy are based on one or two dominant uh, physical, chemical, or biological properties um, that clearly um, determine one from another out of these. Okay, so I'll be providing a handout as well, just so you guys can keep it with you guys, um, some main facts for each of them, but we are gonna go over each of them separately. So the first one are the gelosols. And gelosols are soils that are permanently frozen um, or contain evidence of permafrost near the soil surface. Uh, they're found in the Arctic or the Antarctic, as well as extremely high elevations. And gelosols make up about 9% of the world's uh, glacial-free land surface. The next one is called histosols, and histosols are dominantly composed of more organic matter. In the upper portion, um, this can contain different bogs, peatlands, uh, fens, peats, mucks. Um, and this occurs in extremely wet areas. That means it's saturated year-round. Um, and this is not gonna be suitable for any like foundations or roadways, and this can be highly acidic as well. And this makes up about 1% of our world's glacier-free land surface. Uh, the next one is it's called swadosols, and um, they often have a dark surface uh, with a ashy gray layer, and it may contain some reddish, rusty, coffee-colored um, uh, coloration also and they develop in coarsely textured soils such as sands and loamy sands under you know different evergreens as well making it a bit more acidic and this also contains very low fertility as well and a low uh, clay content and uh, this occupies about four percent of the world's glacier free land surface area the next one is called andazoles and this is uh, typically forms from weathering of volcanic material such as ash um, and this results in more of like a crystal uh, structure. Uh, this material has a high capacity to hold nutrients and water um, and it makes you know the soil very productive and fertile as well so this is some nice soil to um, have any agriculture on grow any type of plants that you want because it has that high um, water holding capacity and the nutrients as well. Uh, they typically occur in areas with high rainfall and cooler temperatures and they um, they take up about one percent of the glacier free land area in the world. Oxazoles are soils for um, that are in the trop tropical or subtropical regions of the world, and they dominate of uh, like iron oxides and quartz. They're pre pretty uh, highly weathered, so they have low fertility, and they're found over eight percent of the world's glacier-free land surface. Vertizoles are clay-rich soils that contain um, a lot of clays that may shrink and swell that are very dramatic. Due to their high clay content, they have um, extremely high levels of fertility as well. But due to the clay, we have a lot of micros, uh, micropores that leaves the soil extremely wet for long periods. And they consist, consist of about 2% of the world's glacier-free land surface. Artisols are soils that occur in climates um, that are pretty dry. They can uh, contain and can accumulate salt, gypsum, and um, carbonates, and they're usually found in hot, cold deserts worldwide. And they occupy about 12% of the Earth's glacier-free land area. Altazoles are soils that are formed in human areas, um, and they are also intensely weathered. And they make up about 8% of the glacier-free land surface in the world.
Mollusols are prairie or grassland soils that have dark, dark coloration and they're extremely um, fertile. They have a lot of calcium and magnesium and they make up about 7% of the world's glacier-free land surface. Alphazols are pretty similar to aldozols, but they're less intensely weathered and less acidic. And they're more fertile. A lot of forest vegetation have different um, alphazols for their soil taxonomy. They make up about 10% of the world's glacier-free land surface. In septosols, they lack a lot of like that clay accumulation in the subsoil, and they occur over a wide range of parent materials as well. So overall, they're going to have a wide range of different characteristics. They occupy about 17% of the world's glacier-free surface. Entozols are the last order that we're going to go over, and they exhibit little to no soil development other than the presence um, of the topsoil horizon. These soils usually have occurred and, and recently developed um, in the last few years. They could have developed from active floodplains, dunes, landslide areas, um, or glaciers as well. They're usually found within all environments, so there's not one specific area in the world. And then the entozols make up the second largest group of soils after inceptosols, occupying about 16% of the Earth's surface. Now here we get into some of the different poor soil management that has led to um, catastrophes worldwide. Here we have one, it's called the Dust Bowl. It happened in 1930. And this occurred in the Southern Plains of, um, Southern Plain region of the US and it suffered from severe dust storms during the period of around 1930. And this dust bowl was pretty much caused by uh, wind erosion due to poor farming practices. So you can see um, they just kept on trying to cultivate the land, cultivate it, cultivate it, and not, you know, have any um, cover crops. And what resulted in that was this huge formation of dust that came through and devastated the whole entire area. And it created a tremendous amount of depression within all of these people, especially the farmers. And they had to resort and leaving that area to find employment elsewhere. It was devastating. Now the next couple slides, I know we talked about like the first day of class, you know, the importance of soils and without soils, what we wouldn't have and whatnot. But I just wanted to briefly go over this. But I have on the first one, you know, different cattle. It says grazing land, feed me. Uh, without soils, how is it going to be fed? How are we going to be able to um, raise different, you know, animals and whatnot so, you know, we could eat? Uh, the whole entire population could eat, especially with the growing populations that we have. So without soils, we, can, we would not have the ability to produce this grazing land to provide meat for our different populations. And don't you think cropland would be a big one too? So now we don't have meat now. Uh, we don't have fruits or vegetables either. So what happens now? What happens to us without the soil that we have? Without our soils, you know, our, our huge forest would not be existing right now. It would have no existence whatsoever. And what would we do for recreation as well? Instead of going to the park, what would we do? Let's go through the city? I'm not sure, at least for me, I like being in the woods. I like going to the park and really being able to de-stress myself. So recreation would definitely be limited without soils. Where would we put our waste? Right now, soils are the main mechanism for getting rid of our waste. So what are we gonna do with our waste if we don't have soils? And I just wanted to have the last slide of explaining the different um, current land uses within the United States for our different types. So we have starting with urban use at 7%, pasture land at eight, rangeland uh, 27, cropland at 25, and then that forest land is one of the biggest at 27%. Uh, the lands that we can serve at 2% and then that other at 4 as well. So we are definitely using a lot and we are going to lose a ton if we don't have soils, you know, high fertile soils as well. Even if we have soils, what do those soils look like and how are we going to manage those? That's the biggest point. How are we going to manage these soils so we can have long-term 
um, benefits for it? You know, what is the future going to look like? What are our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids, what are they going to see? Um, how are the soils going to be 50 years from now, 100 years from now? And what can we do to better that?